This video contains elements that are not suitable for children under the age of 14. Viewer discretion is advised. We're halfway through the specials, folks. So far, we've covered Tatmar, Calling All Engines, The Great Discovery, and Nitrogen Specials. But now let's get on to the Brennan Air Specials and see how they stack up against them. Well, we're covering six of them for this video, but fear not, viewers, we'll get to one of them in a standalone review. Let's kick things off with King of the Railway, the first special officially under Andrew Brenner's pen, and see what bar he set for it. Sir Robert Normby, the Earl of Sodor, returns to Sodor after traveling the world, and he has big plans in store. He's restoring Ulfstead Castle. Meanwhile, Gordon and Spencer get competitive to see who's the fastest, only to come across two streamlined engines called Connor and Caitlin, and Stephen the Rocket tries to find out what his special job is after he's restored, only to get trapped in a mine beneath Ulfstead Castle. Yeah, that's quite a lot to take in, isn't it? For his first official special as head writer, Andrew Brenner seemed to take the story in a lot of different directions, yet he manages to tie them all up together at the end. Of course, the trailer that was released for the US audience didn't exactly give us a clear picture as to what the story was going to be about, which led to many tearing it apart, thinking that the show was going to get worse, not better. Thankfully, that was not to be the case. Much of the story is based around railway series lore, such as the presence of Sir Robert Normby, likely named for Sir Richard Robert Normby, Duke's current grace, and the mention of King Godred, based upon Godred's MacHarold and Crovin, although he seems to be more based upon the latter. And of course, there's Ulstead Castle, which would become a staple of the CGI series right to the end. Outside of references to Sodor lore, we even get flashbacks to Stephen's pre-Sodor days, based upon what happened at the Rainhill Trials of 1820. How did the newbies introduced in this special, only Sir Robert Normby and Stephen play major roles, while Billy's just... there. Connor and Caitlin, however, are introduced very late into the special, close to the 39 minute mark, while they could easily have been held back for series 17, perhaps being hinted at towards the end of the special. And not only that, Gordon and Spencer's subplot could have also worked as a standalone episode, and much like the actual special, it would be the presence of Connor and Caitlin that would make both of them feel threatened. And maybe we reveal who actually wins the race, since we never saw who won at the end of the special. Oh, let me guess. Rachel, is it? Yep. Reviewing King of the Railway, I see. Mind if I take the reins for a bit? Sure, go ahead. Okay. Going on what you said about the plot being all over the place, you're right. If I was doing this, I'd probably cut Caitlin and Connor and have them appear in Season 17, as you said. This would effectively drop Gordon and Spencer subplots. I'd also give Millie a larger role. Instead, having a conflict with her and Duke about who should be the Earl's engine. Come on! Why didn't the production team even think of that? It seems like an obvious plot point. One of the current Earl's predecessors is Duke namesake after all. This could be a good chance to see how Duke bounces off Scaloi, Reneas, Rusty, Duncan, and Luke, as none of the books or the television series really showcase this at all. Not that Luke was in the books, but that's besides the point. And of course, throw in some adorableness with Han and Peter Sam with their grandpa in there. They could act as mediators between Duke and Millie. And I'd also probably trim down the roles of the Stanic agents in general. This honestly seems like it would be fit for the Scaloi crew. Same with Blue Mountain Mystery, actually. What do you think, Zach? That would have definitely worked out. Duke is a crown jewel out of Audrey's characters, and yet he's never mentioned in the CGI series, much less given a physical appearance, likely because Mattel didn't think the derogate engines were marketable, which could also be why they never had a starring role since Series 18, Runaway Engine notwithstanding. That aside, this has been a pretty short review, but there's not a whole lot I could have said about King of the Railway in hindsight. The animation doesn't look that good when compared to the future Brenner specials, but the facial expressions feel a lot more natural, and the camera angles are more dynamic. It was a good thing that they had two separate animation teams, one for the specials and one for the episodes, to prevent one or the other from being burned out. The story was a bit clunky in places, but the characters in the moments between them, especially Steven and Sir Robert, are a lot stronger than what we had in the Nitrogen era, and the dialogue, of course, is hugely improved. I would give King of the Railway a 7 out of 10. Good, but not great. However, I don't think anyone could have predicted how much better things would be with Andrew Brenner on board. For a while, at least. Now let's move on to Tale of the Brave, a special that was released to mark 30 years of Thomas and Friends on the small screen. How much improvement was made between King of the Railway and this special? Let's find out. 
When Thomas is sent to work at the China clay pits with Bill and Ben during a landslide, he sees giant footprints which Percy thinks must be a monster and becomes afraid. He then meets a visiting engine called Gator who takes on a big rubber roll to the little green engine. James makes fun of Percy for being scared, but he proves how cowardly he can be in the midst of his arrogance. Judging by the premise alone, I can definitely say that Tale of the Brave is a far superior take on Day of the Diesels, in that none of the characters are sympathetic assholes at worst, the plot doesn't try too hard to be taken seriously, and it's an overall pleasurable viewing experience. I'd end it right there, but... Let's dig a bit deeper, shall we? I'm gonna start off by saying that James was a good choice for the special's antagonist. He takes advantage of the fact that Percy's afraid of the idea of a monster on Sodor, but in doing so, James shows that he is just as afraid, especially when he thinks Gator's a monster and has an accident while taking the Flying Kipper. Now that the tables have turned on James, he takes his anger and insecurity out on Percy by scaring him with a scrap monster. This causes Percy to want to run away when no one seems to believe him, even Thomas is doubtful, but Gator consoles Percy that running away from your problems is never the answer. If only many people in real life actually follow that bit of advice. Thomas and Percy are both written far better in Tale of the Brave than they were in Day of the Diesels, with the latter character especially shining through towards the end. Even though James had bullied him throughout the special, Percy still risks his life to save James in the landslide of the clay pits. Not to knock on Thomas, of course, but the fact that he's cut off before he could get to Percy makes the Green Engine's triumph all the more satisfying. Shame that that threw that bit of character development out the window for Free Steam Engine's gruff and especially panicky Percy. It must be a troll. A troll? Trolls live under bridges. Don't you remember the three billy goats gruff? Ah! Thomas! I'm coming to save you! Did I mention how much I hate Panicky Percy? Because I hate that episode with every fiber of my being! With all due respect, Zack, considering that Thomas had gone missing at least twice before, Misty Island Rescue is non-canon as far as I'm concerned, and the fact that Thomas nearly fell off a mountain in Big World Big Adventures, and imprisoned in Journey Beyond Sodor, the former being outright mentioned in this episode need I add, I do find Percy's fears to be at least somewhat justified. And that's not even counting the dangers that Thomas had gone through in the 70 verse so far, nearly falling down a mine wherever in United We Stand, and nearly being burnt alive by Diesel 10 and Diesel 10 strikes back. That's as may be, Rachel, but you'd think that Percy would have overcome his anxieties by this point. Anxiety isn't easy to overcome. I know. I get that a lot myself. If someone I knew kept getting lost and no one nearly killed, I'd be worried for them too. No matter how much time had passed, I wouldn't be surprised if Percy got a counseling session after this episode. The poor guy. You do understand what I'm getting at, right? We're not going to come to any agreement on this episode, are we? Nope, but it's probably going to be a debate for another time. Note to self, don't get on Rachel's bad side, ever. Anyway, as an aside, the premise of Thomas working with Bill and Ben do the bridge work on his branch line appears to be inspired from Thomas and the Twins. Even though Christopher Audrey's books will forever be in the shadow of his father's, it's nice that they're being referenced in some capacity. Although Thomas, James, and Percy are the major players throughout this special, it's not just them who shine through. Tale of the Brave is practically an ensemble piece, whether it be Bill and Ben rescuing Thomas from the first landslide despite having previously played a joke on him, Marion's eccentricity, and Emily's big sister persona in full form. Oh, and did I mention this little gem? Be careful out there, James. Monsters can be very hard to see in the dark. But outside of the main trio, the real standout character was Gator. While he's never given a reason for appearing on Sodor here or in Series 18, his friendship with Percy is one of the purest of the entire franchise, and Gator's departure at the end of the special held far more weight than Heroes and Hero of the Rails did. Sure, Gator did return to Sodor for a long lost friend, but he hasn't been seen since. But that doesn't really bother me that much, as it made Gator's appearances feel more special, whereas Hero just exists to appease a fan base that didn't need it to begin with. Oh, and speaking of Series 18, did I mention that Toad's bright idea takes place within Tale of the Brave? Cause it did. An episode taking place during a special was something that has never happened before and, to my knowledge, has never happened since. Somewhere there exists an extended version of Tale of the Brave with Toad's bright idea woven in, kinda like what I did for Red Engines and Shed Trouble. Long and short, Tale of the Brave is basically an ensemble piece. In fact, this special focuses more on character moments than any other special before and since. Not that specials to come didn't have them, mind you, but the strength of the characters was at its strongest in Tale of the Brave here. This special marks a new peak in storytelling for Thomas and Friends. The characters are at their absolute best, the emotional moments do the job they're supposed to, the theme about bravery is strong, and the story has the right mix of drama and comedy. Particularly this little take-bath moment towards the nitrogen era. Hello, Thomas! 
Guess what? Um, let me see. Have you been asked to deliver a giant balloon on a flatbed? And a little shout out to Shakespeare's Hamlet. Oh, alas, poor dinosaur. Tale of the Brave is the quintessential Thomas and Friends special as it captures the feel of the franchise the most with its heart, charm, and character. A 10 out of 10 from me. If you ask me, it really is that amazing and deserves more recognition than it's really given. And so we come to what many fans have called the magnum opus of Thomas and Friends specials, Sodor's Legend of a Lost Treasure. Let's see if it really lives up to that title. When Thomas causes trouble by derailing Gordon's coaches at Natford Station, Sir Topham Hap punishes his number one engine by having him work on the Harwick extension while a new tank engine called Ryan works on his branch line. After getting into another accident, Thomas meets with Sailor John and his sailboat Skiff and helps them find the lost treasure of Captain Callus, unaware of the pirate's true intentions. Well, what can I say? Soder's Legend of a Lost Treasure is another peak for storytelling in Thomas and Friends specials. In fact, I dare say there's a pretty razor-thin gap between this and Tale of the Brave. But which of the two do I prefer? Well, let's delve into Lost Treasure before I make my decision. After being portrayed as an all-loving hero with shades of cheekiness in the previous two Brenner specials, free if you include Blue Mountain Mystery, Thomas is back to his characterization in the early Railway Series books by letting his cheekiness get the better of him, landing him into trouble more than once. That could be an entire video discussion on its own, but the long and short is that Thomas learns that you'll never get far in life if you refuse to take responsibility for your actions. Yes, I know some will argue that he should have grown out of that phase by now, but I've got a simple counter-argument to that. Many adults in real life have difficulty admitting as to when they're in the wrong and will blame others for their mistakes. In fact, I'd argue that Thomas's character arc holds up just as much as it did back in 2015, perhaps even more so. Anyway, with how much Thomas kept causing trouble, with every incident he's involved in, his arrogance is humbled and he learns to admit his mistakes, eventually regaining Sir Topham Hatt's favor. Hey, uh, Zach? Oh, hey, Mike, what's up? Since we're bringing up Legend of the Lost Treasure, don't you think we should talk about... This scene? Thomas the Tank Engine! Uh oh. What are you playing at now? I thought you could learn to be more responsible if I sent you to work here. But, sir, this time it's really not my fault! No, I... Thomas! I've had quite enough of your excuses! Go to your shed immediately! And you can stay there for the rest of the afternoon! Oh, right. If we didn't bring that up, I'd imagine a lot of people would go off on me in the comments for not doing so. Care to do the honors, Mike? Gladly. <clears throat> First off, while I do agree that that was the worst moment of the movie, emphasis on the word moment, I feel that a lot of people are missing the point behind Thomas's behavior in that scene. Up until that point, Thomas had been reckless when shunting Gordon's coaches into Napford Junction, and Sir Topham sent him to work on a new branch line while Ryan took over for the day. And while Thomas was bringing the rails and ballast to the new branch line, he wasn't paying attention to the danger signs and ended up in a hole in the ground. Both of these incidents, along with the arrival of a new tank engine, made Thomas feel as though his position as Sir Topham's number one engine was being threatened. Which brings us to the dynamite incident. When Ryan needed to fill up with coal, he didn't know about the bad coal from the old hopper, and Thomas didn't warn him about it. Then when Ryan came back, a dynamite fuse in one of his trucks was lit, and Thomas had tried to clear it out of the way before it exploded. From a distance, Sir Topham thought Thomas was trying to hurt Ryan. That, combined with how much money was wasted, led to his frustration with the little blue tank engine. Not only that, Thomas previously caused issues with delaying the express, and by extension several other trains, and acted rather carelessly when shunting the flatbeds into Callus's cavern. On top of that, dynamite's costly to obtain, and Thomas basically wasted some of Topham's money. Wanting to get back into Topham's good grace again, Thomas tries to stop Sailor John from escaping with Captain Callus's treasure that night, and by morning, thinking he's in trouble again, he tries to apologize until Sir Topham says this. There's nothing to be sorry about. I'm proud of you. Ryan told me everything, and I know you did your best to stop that pirate getting away. And then there's this bit that brings things full circle. My engines are much more important to me than any treasure. And you, Thomas, are my number one. 
It's like what Zack said about the confrontation scene in Blue Mountain Mystery, or, for a non-Thomas example, Twilight and Pinky's falling out in the 2017 My Little Pony movie. It seems a fair few people miss the point and take sides before looking at both of them and or the subtext as to why it happened. My point is, you cannot let one conflict ruin an otherwise excellent product, especially when said conflict is fixed by the end. And there's something I would like to add in as well, guys. I do get that Thomas was to blame for starting his string of mistakes which slowly made him isolated at the time, but who do you think is really to blame for this whole mess? Gordon, probably? I know most other people would think that it wasn't entirely Gordon's fault to begin with, but if you think about it, if Gordon had kept his big mouth shut, he probably wouldn't give Thomas those silly ideas which led him to making those mistakes to begin with. So, honestly, I think Gordon is entirely to blame, and yet he shows no responsibility or remorse for starting these chain of events whatsoever. Yeah, that is something that was never fully resolved or brought up again. Anyway, and speaking of human characters, there's Sailor John, one of the best antagonists that the franchise has ever had. Although we don't know much about his backstory, I get the impression that he's been looking for Captain Callus' treasure for a long time. That must have caused him to go bad by the time Thomas meets him and Skiff. Thanks to John Hurd's performance, rest peacefully, Officer Kane, we're practically drawn to the sailor's charisma, even though it's all an act. The best bad guys are those you love and hate at the same time, and Sailor John is P.T. Boomer done right as A. He's the villain of an actual Thomas the Tank Engine movie, and B. There's more mystery in what you're not told as opposed to what you are. Speaking of celebrity guest stars, Eddie Redmayne makes his sole voice acting appearance as Ryan the Purple Engine before being taken over by Stephen Kinman. While I will say that Ryan is Stanley done better, the former felt a bit too similar to the latter, which is where the similarities to The Great Discovery come in, but thankfully, Ryan has since been given more definition as a character. Although Kinman did make Ryan sound a bit too similar to Paxton, I feel Redmayne's performance here stands out more. I would have liked to see what else he could have done as Ryan had he stuck around for a bit longer. As I contrasted the drama in Thomas and Sailor John's story, Marion's subplot adds some much needed comedy relief when she thinks Oliver the Great Western Engine and Oliver the Excavator are the same and believes that the Arlesdale Trio, making their debut in the TV series, are magic engines. It's even funnier that nobody takes her seriously as they just get on with their work as usual. Olivia Coleman just steals every scene she's in. Oliver? Oliver? But I thought you made a wish. I thought... You changed into a digger! There can't be two Olivers! <laughs> yes, there can! <laughs> Are there weak points in the story? Unfortunately, yes. The subplot with Thomas finding Captain Callus' ship and Rocky taking the credit for it is never properly resolved. The rest of the story hinged on that, yet it's dropped in favor of Thomas finding comfort with Sailor John before discovering his true colors. Mind you, that's nothing compared to Henry's subplot in thinking that Skip is a ghost ship, especially as it doesn't get a proper resolution either. Henry's characterization was not all that good in series 18 and 19, especially if you compare it to Henry's hero in series 20 onward, but Lost Treasure was perhaps where Henry's wimpy personality reached its nadir. Neither subplot is something that hugely affects the main story, but they do stick out like a sore thumb. But perhaps the biggest problem with Lost Treasure is that the continuity between said special and series 19 is quite muddled. The special takes place after series 19, yet it was released before it was even halfway finished airing on TV. This is a problem that would later result in continuity errors with The Great Race in series 20, and especially Journey Beyond Sodor in series 21. I'll delve deeper into that when I talk about The Avenger Begins, but that special being a last minute addition into the production schedule really screwed things up in the long run. Who knows what might have happened had it not been commissioned by Mattel. Sodor's Legend of a Lost Treasure is the special that feels the most like a Thomas and Friends movie, and along with Sale the Brave, it proves that Thomas doesn't need another theatrical film so long as the right people are in charge. Granted, Lost Treasure was released in theaters for a couple of weekends, but the point still stands. Like Tale of the Brave, Lost Treasure gets a full score of 10 out of 10, but which of the two do I prefer? I'm gonna go for Tale of the Brave, because of Lost Treasure, while it does have the stronger story, it does have a subplot or two that's never fully resolved, not even in series 20, whereas Tale of the Brave feels more complete in terms of story, and it's that reason that I believe Sora's Legend of a Lost Treasure is worthy of a silver medal.